This is Unit 2A, Part 3. <clears throat> We've already uh, discussed two out of the three major mechanisms uh, that occur in the kidney. One is filtration, the second is um, reabsorption, and now we'll discuss uh, briefly on this slide uh, secretion, and then we'll go on to some other topics. Uh, secretion is uh, essentially, to put it very simply, uh, reabsorption in reverse. Instead of uh, molecules moving from the space of the peritubular, uh, <clears throat> instead of molecules moving from the tubule into the uh, peritubular capillaries or vasorecta, it's a question of, and which is reabsorption, it's a question of substances moving from the peritubular capillaries into the tubular cells um, uh, and then into the filtrate, into the filtrate fluid. Uh, secretion is in fact important for uh, <clears throat> disposing uh, waste products that normally are found in the urine but are not formed in the filtrate and form only by uh, secretion. Um, it's a way of getting rid of um, <clears throat> Uh, it's a way of, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, it's a way of getting uh, rid of uh, increased amounts of urea or uric acid, getting rid of uh, excess potassium ions, and also is involved in the mechanism of controlling the blood pH. As I told you about the respiratory and renal uh, systems, kidney system is uh, responsible for balance of uh, pH in the blood plasma. <clears throat> so this is uh, part of that. Well, um, let's look at some of the uh, regulatory mechanisms uh, for the overall concentration of urine and uh, volume. Um, when we discuss uh, the concentration of solutes in the in uh, body fluids, we typically talk about osmolality instead of osmolarity. There's an important distinction. Osmolarity is the number of solute particles dissolved in one liter of water, whereas osmolality is the number of particles dissolved in one kilogram of water. <clears throat> now, as you know, uh, or should know, the volume of the fluid water will change with uh, temperature and therefore the more accurate measure is osmolality, which is solutes per kilo, because a kilo is a kilo, whereas a liter sometimes could be a little more than a kilo or a little less. And so we talk about osmolality. Now the osmolality really reflects the solution's ability to cause osmosis. If the osmolality is high, it will tend to cause osmosis drawing water towards it, into it. Osmosis, of course, is the diffusion of water. If the osmolality is low, <clears throat> the water will go in the opposite direction out of the solution into the uh, different, the other compartment. For body fluids, uh, we measure in milliosmoles. It's, you know, uh, that's those are the typical units. And essentially, the, what the kidneys are doing is they try to maintain solute levels in body fluids at a constant relatively constant, there's some range there of 300 milliosmoles. So in turn, and this is always for extracellular, not intracellular. So extracellular fluid <coughs> uh, osmolality is uh, maintained at uh, about 300 milliosmoles. And a major mechanism that helps to uh, maintain this is called the countercurrent mechanism that's operating the kidneys. This mechanism involves interaction between the filtrate flowing through the loop of Henle and the uh, blood plasma flowing through the blood vessels, the capillaries around the loop of Henle, and that is the peritubular capillaries, particularly the vasa recta, which are around um, juxtamedullary nephrons. Remember, juxtamedullary nephrons are those nephrons that send their loop of Henle deeper down into the medulla. <clears throat> if you look at the solute concentration, the osmolality in the loop of Henle, 
the filtrate fluid varies uh, from uh, the top of the descending limb of the loop of Henle. It starts at 300, but then it gets concentrated as it goes down that descent, its descending limb. So from the top of the descending limb of the loop of Henle, which is right after the proximal convoluted tubule, it starts at 300 and then it gets more and more concentrated. The fluids in the filtrate get more and more concentrated as they go down till they reach an osmolality of about 1200 milliosmoles at the bottom of the loop of, the Hen of Henle where it turns around and starts coming back up. That osmotic gradient, that change from 300 to 1200, that gradient is not um, uh, removed, it's maintained because of the, the, because the blood and the vasa recta around it will equilibrate with the interstitial fluid, which is also at the same kind of, has that same gradient of uh, osmolarity values. And so you see here, in this area that I'm going to mark uh, here, we have the uh, loops of Henle coming down into this area here. There are, of course, millions of them because there are a million nephrons in each uh, kidney. But the uh, <coughs> tissue in the kidney, it's not just in the loop of Henle, but it's also in the surrounding tissue that you have this gradient as you can see here, there's an increase in uh, tissue osmolarity, the interstitial tissue. And what's not shown here is that the same kind of gradient is also present in the peritubular capillaries or vasa recta. Okay. <clears throat> so this uh, loop of Henle is uh, referred to as a countercurrent uh, multiplier descending limb. The way it works is that the descending limb of the loop of Henle is relatively impermeable to solutes, but quite permeable to water. And I'll show you what that does in the next diagram or in a couple of diagrams. So it's relatively impermeable to solutes, but permeable to water. And then the ascending limb is permeable to solutes, but relatively impermeable to water. The collecting ducts that uh, <clears throat> are that these, uh, that these um, tubules empty into uh, are in addition permeable to urea, but we're not gonna talk about that right now. <clears throat> the uh, counter current uh, exchanger uh, effect of the vasorecta is also important. It helps to maintain the osmotic gradient in the interstitial fluid and delivers blood to cells in the area. In other words, it delivers oxygen to cells in the area. Uh, but it's also involved in secretion and uh, reabsorption, of course. Okay, so <clears throat> this diagram shows the overall um, uh, change in uh, osmolality uh, going from the uh, glomerulus where you have a uh, osmolality of osmolality of the of the uh, filtrate which is the same as the plasma around 300 milliosmoles and it goes into the proximal tubule and maintains at 300 milliosmoles but once it gets into the descending limb of the loop of henley uh, water is can move out by osmosis. It is permeable to water, but not solutes. And therefore, as the water gets drawn out, as it goes down into that uh, tissue that has surrounding higher osmolality, water uh, is pulled out by osmosis and the osmolality of the fluid, the filtrate fluid rises as high as 1200, right down at the bottom of the loop of Henle. Then, the process changes and what happens is as the fluid rises up in the ascending limb of the loop of Henle, this section of the loop is uh, permeable to solutes but not water. And so solutes, and we're talking about mainly here electrolyte solutes like uh, sodium chloride, get pulled out because as you're moving up you're going into a, a area of tissue that has a 
and here it is, the interstitial uh, tissue fluid osmolality. So you're going into an area that, ha from, uh, that has from high to lower osmolality, and so salt helps, uh, salt can move out. And so the end effect is that you actually get a uh, fluid which has had uh, water pulled out and then sodium chloride pulled out but the urea, which is the major uh, nitrogen containing toxic uh, waste product that needs to be eliminated from the body remains in this fluid. So it's a way of actually concentrating uh, the filtrate so that the urea gets concentrated in it. It's a way of uh, not losing, remember I did tell you that the filtrate that forms is a, quite a large volume and most of it, the vast majority of it gets reabsorbed. So most of that water in that initial filtrate is reabsorbed here and um, actually a lot of it is reabsorbed up here in the proximal convoluted tubule along the salts but then remaining a large amount of the remaining water gets pulled out here and then a large amount of the remaining NaCl gets pulled out here so you end up actually <clears throat> in the end with a fluid that has a often lower osmolarity osmolality I'm sorry than the tissues, three, uh, 100, and that progresses out through the distal convoluted tubule into the uh, collecting duct. I'm gonna change color here, and then goes down and is eliminated as urine. Remember, it's not urine until it gets out. <clears throat> Meanwhile, and this is the uh, uh, vasorecta, these are peritubular capillaries, they, uh, they're they shown separately, uh, separated away from the loop of Henle, but remember they go around this loop of Henle, they surround it. Meanwhile, <clears throat> the salt moving out here and the water moving out uh, here um, is, is um, also uh, interacting with uh, the peritubular capillaries or vasa recta and the <clears throat> um, the, w the way it's happening here is that um, water is moving out and so this blood actually gets concentrated also in terms of its osmolarity so it stays uh, in parallel with the concentration of the filtrate increasing here from 300 to 1200 and then decreasing from 1200 to 300. Remember it's maintained at 300 otherwise so it doesn't go below 300. In this way um, the tissues here, the tissue osmolarity, the interstitial tissue osmolarity and the vasorecta or peritubular capillary osmolarity is maintained uh, in such a way that it has the effect on the movement of water and salts that uh, I've described. And that's the countercurrent mechanism operating so that the uh, uh, water and uh, NaCl can be pulled out of the um, filtrate and you get a filtrate that has ordinarily about a hundred but you'll see there are other mechanisms operating that can change that also. But it is a concentrated solution in the end of urea, uh, containing quite a bit of urea. Okay. <clears throat> now, uh, the volume of fluid uh, in the urine is actually under regulatory control. There are situations certainly when um, <clears throat> it's it's uh, a person uh, a person is uh, going to uh, excrete dilute urine because they have uh, been drinking more fluids, more water, and they have an excess, and they're 
uh, blood plasma osmolarity is lower than 300, so they need to get rid of uh, urine, uh, of water, so they would produce a dilute urine. Uh, in this case, the uh, filtrate is formed and uh, um, it does get diluted in the ascending uh, loop of Henle as the, um, <clears throat> as the solutes are pulled out. Um, but this filtrate is allowed to continue on uh, into the collecting duct and down the collecting duct and uh, excreted at uh, 100 milliosmoles, a fair, a dilute urine with, you know, a fairly, therefore a fairly larger amount of water. As long as uh, the hormone ADH or antidiuretic uh, hormone is not being secreted. Antidiuretic hormone, I would remind you, is uh, produced uh, in the hypothalamus and then exported down to the posterior lobe of the pituitary and is secreted <coughs> uh, when uh, a person is trying to conserve water. In this case, where they're trying to get rid of water and they want to form a dilute urine, you would not have ADH being secreted. So you can form dilute urine when uh, ADH is not being released. Um, and in that case, uh, that 100 milliosmol uh, fluid that's formed, in fact, it can even have somewhat less than 100. It can be even as low as 50. I've seen 50. I've seen 80 in student samples occasionally. But it's uh, formed in the, uh, it's around 80 as it goes through the distal convoluted, 80 or 100 as it goes through the con distal convoluted tubule and then down the collecting ducts, which uh, are impermeable to water as long as no, uh, in other words, they can't re you can't get a reabsorption of any water as long as ADH wasn't produced. Um, now, <clears throat> the opposite uh, situation when uh, concentrated urine needs to be produced because the person is somewhat dehydrated, they're um, uh, so they want to conserve water and keep that on board uh, or their uh, uh, plasma osmolality is uh, higher than 300 so you want to retain as much water as possible uh, in that case antidiuretic hormone uh, will be produced it will inhibit diuresis which is the release of water through the urine or loss of water through the urine and that helps to equalize um, uh, and maintain the osmolarity of the uh, uh, filtrate and the interstitial fluid and <clears throat> will, you will get uh, uh, water reabsorption from the collecting ducts. So if ADH is produced, what happens in the collecting ducts is that you get um, formation of pores that, uh, that water can move through called uh, the pores are called aquaporins. This kind of ADH dependent water reabsorption occurring in the collecting ducts is called uh, uh, facultative water reabsorption. It's the ADH sig is the signal that you're going to be producing a, a concentrated urine by reabsorbing uh, from the filtrate a lot of the water. And uh, the kidney's ability to do that depends on that uh, fairly high med medullary osmotic gradient. Okay, so let's look at this diagram that covers both those situations, forming dilute versus forming concentrated urine. As I showed you before, uh, in the glomerulus, you're going to get uh, formation of a filtrate into the glomerular capsule of about 300 milliosmoles. It starts, it goes through the uh, proximal convoluted tubule where a lot of reabsorption of both salt and water occurs, but then it starts going down the loop of Henle at a osmolarity of 300 and then water gets pulled out. So it rises to as high as 1200 and then salt gets pulled out. So it drops again and it drops down to 100 milliosmoles. 
and that's maintained in the distal convoluted tubule and it goes into the collecting duct and it goes out as a dilute urine with, with an osmolarity of, uh, it can be as low as 50. As I said, I've seen 80 milliosmoles, but here on average is about 100 dilute urine. Now, in another situation where the person does not need to uh, uh, get rid of water, but in the opposite situation where they're somewhat dehydrated or their <clears throat> plasma osmolarity is uh, above 300 so that they want to retain as much water as possible, then they will secrete. Everything essentially is the same all the way up till this area here. They will secrete ADH and ADH will uh, trigger the uh, formation of aquaporins through which water can move and the water is going to move out. Remember the tissues have that, uh, the interstitial tissues have that gradient in them of, you know, increasing <clears throat> osmolarity. And so that tends to help move the water out of this. Once the pores are formed, it will move out. If there's still some excess ure urea that actually does move out, but then it gets secreted back into the loop of Henle there. So this is a way of making a quite a concentrated urine and urine can be put out up to 1200. And you know that you sometimes produce concentrated urine. It's gonna be a darker yellow. And sometimes you put out a, a less concentrated urine, mostly depending upon how much water you've been drinking. But it also can depend upon how much salt you put into your uh, food. If you're putting excess salt in, you would tend to put out <clears throat> a more concentrated urine. Well, there are compounds that have uh, diure diuretic effects. They will cause diuresis. They increase the volume of the urine by increasing the amount of water that gets put out. Any substance, in fact, that cannot be reabsorbed but stays in the filtrate will have a diuretic effect. It will tend to contribute typically towards the not every substance, but it'll tend to contribute towards the osmotic effect or osmotic potential and hold water in the filtrate, keep it in. A uh, substance that can be reabsorbed, but there's so much of it in the filtrate that it's um, saturated, the ability of the renal tubules to reabsorb, that will cause diuresis. And anything that inhibits sodium reabsorption, because sodium is involved in um, in the movement of water, then anything that inhibits sodium reabsorption will also increase the output of water and have a diuretic effect. Some of the known diuretics include uh, glucose. If a person is a uh, diabetic, untreated, uh, uncontrolled diabetes, there will be higher glucose than, well, normally there won't be any glucose in the urine, but there could be glucose in the urine in a untreated uh, 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 diabetic who's, uh, who's not uh, careful. And that uh, glucose will help to retain the water in the filtrate and carry the water out. Another uh, molecule that can cause uh, increased diuresis, and many of you are familiar with this, is alcohol. Alcohol, drinking alcohol will cause you to put out more urine increasing volume, you'll put out a di dilute urine. And the reason for that is that alcohol has a direct effect on ADH release, it inhibits ADH release. There are other compounds like caffeine in coffee or tea that have a diuretic effect, typically because they inhibit sodium reabsorption. And I'm not gonna talk about these other uh, compounds, they're used pharmaceutically or used to be used pharmaceutically. Okay. Very important concept in or uh, feature of uh, renal physiology that should be understood is the idea of renal clearance, which is the volume of plasma that can be cleared of a particular substance over a given time. So it's something that is monitored and is a good measure of uh, how your kidneys are functioning because it can measure the glomerular filtration rate. 
I remind you the glomerular filtration rate is key, the key uh, feature or function in the kidneys. So these uh, clearance, renal clearance tests determine the glomerular filtration rate. They help to uh, detect whether there has been any damage to the glomeruli. Remember you have uh, 1 million nephrons in each kidney, so there's 1 million glomeruli in each kidney. And the glomeruli typically actually are the place where most uh, renal damage occurs and uh, disease processes that affect the kidneys. So it's a way of uh, monitoring to, to see if, uh, it's a way of um, screening to see if there has been any uh, glomerular damage. And it's also a way of uh, monitoring uh, the progress of a previously diagnosed disease to see if it has uh, worsened or is uh, uh, stable. The conditions are stable or if the damage to glomeruli is increasing all by doing a <clears throat> renal clearance test. Now the key thing in clearance is to follow a molecule that does not get reabsorbed. And that molecule, I can tell you, is, uh, and I'm not sure why it's not written here, but it's creatinine. So essentially the test is called, this clearance test is called a creatinine clearance test. Creatinine is steadily produced into the, um, into the blood plasma and uh, all of it is uh, cleared from the blood plasma into the filtrate and none of it gets reabsorbed. It all comes out in the, anything that goes in the filtrate is, comes out in the urine. So there's a steady production of creatinine and there's a steady excretion of creatinine. And uh, so there is a normal level of creatinine found in the blood plasma and it should not change. It's a good measure of um, kidney function, glomerular filtration rate actually. The, the uh, <clears throat> equation that is uh, key uh, to doing renal clearance is uh, looking at renal clearance rate. You look at the concentration of a substance in the urine divided by uh, times the uh, rate of formation of urine. This is milliliters per mil, and this is milligrams per mil. So when you have milligrams per mil of a substance uh, times milliliters per mil, the flow rate, what you end up with is, this is per minute, what you end up with is these two cancel out and you have milligrams per mil. So you have uh, milligrams per ml. Divided by <clears throat> the concentration of the substance in the plasma. I'm sorry. I made a mistake. It's not milligrams per mil, it's milligrams per minute, of course. Uh, here we go, milligrams per minute. Because the two mils cancel out here, so you have milligrams divided by per minute when you look at uh, this part of the equation, divided by concentration P of the same substance in the plasma. So essentially it's looking at <coughs> clearance here, milligrams per mil, clearance, uh, the amount being put out in the urine, divided by the amount of the substance in the plasma. And they're always going to look at creatinine, that's the key thing that they measure. There are some other general features of urine that uh, you should be aware of. You probably already are. It, it can range in color from anywhere from clear, very clear, pale yellow to a deep yellow. This is due to a uric uh, a molecule that has a yellow color. A it, it colors the urine uh, and the molecule is uh, uro or urobilin. Um, 
very concentrated urine, of course, is a deep color. There are certain drugs, vitamin supplements, and foods that you can eat that can change the color of the urine. <clears throat> and sometimes you find uh, that the urine is cloudy, and that often is an indicator of infection in the urinary tract, a U UIT, or urinary tract infection, cloudy urine. It may not be. It may be simply precipitation as the urine stands in a uh, urine collection cup and cools down. You could have precipitation of, of some uh, molecules that uh, are in very high concentration in some people. But often enough, cloudy urine uh, indicates it's due to the bacteria in it and uh, it indicates the presence of a urinary tract infection. Another physical characteristic of urine that you might be aware of is um, odor. Now, urine does not particularly smell strongly, but if, uh, if there's a place where people are outdoors, say, where people are constantly urinating, then it does, with time, develop there in that area a strong odor. And that odor, in fact, is ammonia. Because what is happening, you see, is that the uh, urea can be broken down by bacteria in the environment. And uh, there are bacterial and bacteria that contain enzymes that can break down the urea to form ammonia. We don't, pr we produce tiny amounts of of ammonia. The bacteria can produce lots of uh, uh, ammonia from urea and it'll have a strong odor. Uh, certain drugs and even vegetables can also cause a change in the odor of your, the urine. You may have noticed that soon after, within 20 or 30 minutes of eating asparagus, that your urine would have quite a strong odor coming off uh, when you pee into the bowl completely normal. It's not a big deal. Another uh, f important physical characteristic is the pH. As I told you, the, both the respiratory and renal systems are in, uh, important in the regulation of pH. The, and therefore, because they regulate pH, the, uh, the pH of the urine can vary if you need to get if your body needs to get rid of some uh, excess acid, then the pH of the urine would drop. If it needs to get rid of alkaline uh, uh, molecules, then the urine would uh, have a higher uh, pH. It maintains the pH somewhere around six, but it certainly can range depending on your diet and circumstances. Specific gravity is another aspect, physical characteristic of uh, urine that's uh, typically measured. I remind you that um, I would remind you that the specific gravity is the uh, density, <clears throat> the density of the, the specific gravity of a solution is the density of that uh, solution divided by the density of water at uh, standard temperature and pressure. Now the density of water at standard temperature and pressure is equal to one gram per milliliter. And the density of a fluid depends on how many solutes are dissolved in it. So, you know, a dilute urine would, if a dilute urine would have a, a density close to one, and one divided by one is one. So a dilute urine, which is almost all water, would have a fairly low specific gravity. If the specific gravity rises, that's an indicator that, here, this is the urine. I'll put a U here for density of the urine. A higher specific gravity would indicate there are a lot of solutes uh, dissolved in it. The chemical composition of urine on average, not always, it's not a constant because you're getting rid of things more or less depending on what you have in excess or not, right? So the, how dilute it is, the water content can go up or down, solutes can go up or down depending on your what you're taking in in your diet, but on average, about 95% water and 5% solutes. Most of the solutes uh, are electrolytes, uh, but also, of course, nitrogenous waste products that have to be gotten rid of. 
almost all are urine uh, almost all are urea uh, urea is very water soluble and that's a good way of that's how we get rid of our nitrogen waste uh, the other one is creatinine. It also contains nitrogen, and it's steadily produced as we steadily pr uh, produce, as we steadily release it into our plasma. It's gotten rid of as a waste product. And people also have some uric acid production into the urine. Uric acid is not particularly at all soluble in water. It's It's often uh, in crystalline form and uh, they take a urine sample and they'll put it in a test tube and spin it down and look for those crystals because the crystals can actually cause a problem. And the problem that uric acid causes is that in some people who um, are higher producers of uric acid, the uric acid crystallizes it and the crystals deposit in the joints, particularly the joint at the base of the big toe. And this leads to a painful inflammatory uh, disease or uh, condition called gout due to deposition of uric acid crystals. It can happen in other joints, but most often is in the base of the big toe. Other things that might, uh, other solutes of course, are any of the, these electrolytes that are commonly found in the body and sometimes are secreted in different amounts. <clears throat> any abnormally high concentration of any particular constituent that's normally found there uh, or things that aren't normally found there, uh, but any abnormal high concentration of something that's normally found there can perhaps indicate some sort of pathological process, a disease process occurring. So it's a, quite a nice, easily accessible window an easily accessible sample that's a window on the uh, state of metabolism of a person's physiological systems. Just to uh, finish off in terms of the anatomy, this is the anatomy of the lower urinary tract in the male on this side, and that's the lower urinary tract of the female. I imagine that you uh, could figure that out on your own. The male urinary system or renal system is not only involved in uh, excretion of urine, but is also involved in reproduction. And the female uh, system is solely involved in excretion of urine. The key difference is the structures associated with uh, formation of semen like the prostate gland or the, uh, what else is shown here, bulbourethral gland, they don't show the seminiferous tube, uh, seminiferous uh, glands, uh, seminiferous ve vesicles. Um, the uh, one thing that's characteristic, of course, is the fact that the urethra is much longer Okay, here are the two ureters coming down from the kidney, same in the female. But the urethra in the male is, for obvious reasons, much longer. And for that reason, the reason that it's much longer than urinary tract infections or UTIs are very, much less common in males than they are in females because most urinary tract infections, almost virtually almost all of them, occur due to entry of the bacteria from through the opening of the urethra to the outside. And it's much easier for bacteria to work their way up a shorter distance into the bladder in the female than in the male. In the end, normally, urine is in fact uh, sterile. There are no bacteria growing in it. There's a constant flushing out of the system uh, due to the flow of urine. So anything that does get start to get in at the tip of the urethra typically is washed away. But it can occur and normally you would find most of the bacteria in a region of the bladder that is uh, uh, outlined by a triangle formed from the opening of the two uh, ureters into the bladder and the opening of the urethra right there. So this area here, 
if you drew a dotted imaginary line, this triangular area here, that's called the trigone at the base of the bladder there. And it's shown here, trigone. And uh, that's where you typically would find the bacteria in, for, uh, involved in urinary tract infection accumulating in that area. Urinating has a number of words to synonyms to describe it. Not only urine, urinating, but uh, voiding or peeing, to put it more simply. Now, the physiological term is micturition, which you will probably never hear uh, other than in a course like this. But typically in the hospital, they use any one of these three terms voiding, urinary, urinating, or peeing. It's the act of emptying the bladder. I'm not going to get into the uh, uh, nerve neurophysiological control mechanisms that help you to uh, hold in the urine until you're ready to release it. But one point I will uh, tell you is that the, ur the wall of the bladder is made of smooth muscle which has the unusual ability to relax as it gets filled or stretched with urine. So the bladder can be quite small when empty and then as it fills with urine, it relaxes so it can stre get stretched out more and more, but eventually it reaches a limit and then the pressure starts to build and that's when you feel the urge to uh, void. I'm not gonna get into all of this, it's uh, more than you need. And it's just too much regulatory neurophysiology. Let's leave it alone. Other facts, and when I say other facts, typically that's the last slide on a system and uh, it's a hodgepodge of uh, extra things, each of which could you could talk for you know a long time on. But, you know, you should be aware of these uh, f uh, um, attributes or characteristics of the urinary system. In infants, uh, they have small bladders and the kidneys don't concentrate the urine. Uh, they can't concentrate the urine. That ends up resulting in frequent peeing in little kids, infants, uh, babies. They pee often and they'll drink quite often. Uh, eventually, they do learn how to control their uh, voluntary urethral sphincters, but that requires development of the nervous system. So until then, they're just peeing freely uh, out into their diaper or elsewhere, and they just l l let it blast out. <laughs> Another thing is that you should be aware of is that uh, 80% of uh, urinary tract infections are due to a bacteria called Escherichia coli or E. coli. It's a gram-negative bacteria. It's uh, present in very high numbers in the feces. So a lot of uh, urinary tract infections are in fact due to fecal contamination. In terms of sexually transmitted uh, uh, diseases or infections, uh, they can cause serious inflammatory uh, effects in the urinary tract. And that's one of the symptoms when a person has burning with uh, urinate, urine, uh, when urinating or peeing. But a lot of uh, STIs, sexually transmitted infections, are uh, asymptomatic. The, you have no symptoms. The only symptom that might, the only sign of it may be a cloudy urine or a, um, uh, uh, an, uh, urine that has an odor because the bacteria are breaking down the urea into ammonia. So the person smells a strong smell of the urine. With age, kidney function declines and also control of the sphincters and elderly can often become incontinent. That means they can't hold their urine. They can't control their sphincter well. And so we reach the end of uh, renal physiology. That's the last slide. Uh, this is the end of unit. No, we haven't finished the end of renal physiology. There's also unit 2B and 2C after this. Uh, and 
you'll see uh, there's still a fair amount to do. It's a complex system. So this is the end of unit uh, 2A, part three.